The Stewards, A World of Fools and Knaves, by Mike Walker. The story of Charles I. On a cold, grey, heartless day in February of 1587, the English killed the Queen of Scotland. An axe was used to cut her head from her body. But the English learned two very great lessons that cheerless morning. Firstly, that queens may die. But more than this, they learned that it was not really cold steel that takes a life, but the far, far colder process of protocols and laws and committees and acts of parliament. I was a queen when I was 17, queen of England, and all was before me. <coughs> Sweetheart, are you all right? Oh, take it away. Oh, I've sicked up my breakfast and last night's dinner, and I should think everything else I've eaten in the last couple of days. And I'm about to meet my husband, the king of England, for the first time, and no, I'm not all right. And it's raining still. That's England for you. You know they don't like us over here. I should never have come. Only I didn't really have a choice, did I? Who does? You would have thought queens might. Then make that choice. Stand straight and go out and see your husband. <sighs> Is he actually as short as they say? Your Majesty. Mm. 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 Madam? Mm. Maria? My dear? Mm. May I welcome you as my dearest heart and mm. give you this kiss in token of my love. And it's really, really annoying when people finish my words for me. You're not wearing high heels, are you? Uh, no, I really am th this short, mm. as God made me. I think you're quite tall for a girl, whereas I'm a quite short for a king, actually. Well, quite short-tongued. And you, madam, are quite sharp-tongued. You had best take care that you do not cut yourself with your own sharp wit. I'm certain Madame de France did not intend any disrespect to your majesty. Ah, Steeny, always there when needed. Coming between husband and wife. Serving my master the king, madam. But of course you are tired and nervous, and here we are expecting you. To behave like a queen, yes? I can assure you, my lord, I know my duty well enough. Sire, I thank you for your kiss, and return it in kindness to my husband. Oh, this is all so strange to me, Majesty. I, I hope you will allow me some time. Always time enough, madam. Do you dance? Oh, the Queen dances admirably, sir. I can attest to that, personally. We had been married by proxy in France. The Duke of Buckingham had stood for the King, stood rather taller than the King. The ladies loved him, and the men hated him, and I hated him too. Steenie's right, you do dance well. Is he always right, your Steenie? Always. <sighs> but I didn't realise until it was too late that it was a case of marry one, get two. Why are they shouting, sir? For you, madam. You are popular with the people. They are welcoming you to their hearts. That is a very... Oh! What's that? Royal salute. How many of... Steenie, how many... How many cannons are firing the salute? Oh, only about... 1,500. Welcome to London. 
Madam! Your Majesty, I give you joy of the day of your official coronation. I thank you for your good wishes. If we cannot stand together as I b believe we ought to in the cathedral, shall we at least walk to the door together? I wish it could be different. I would far rather you were beside me than watching from a distance. Sir, no, I cannot enter the chiefest place of your religion in the land. I will never give up my faith. It is truly held. Mm. That's the thing with faith, I suppose. I have helped as far as I can. I wrote to France to ask for mercy for the Protestants at La Rochelle. As far, but not far enough. Some say the fault lies with the Duke of Buckingham. Were he a better general, they say, then a better end had been achieved for your friends over there. I do not like your tone, madam. I do not like your chief minister, sir. They tell me, my people, that your parliament does not like him either. Parliament will do as they are told, madam, as should an obedient wife. But whilst a man needs a wife, I do not see, sir, why a king needs a parliament. No time for this. Later, madam. Will there be an answer or an evasion? King may need a wife. Damned if I know why a wife needs an education. Majesty, the king has asked me to escort you to the place that has been set aside so you may view the procession when it leaves the abbey. It is wet, sir. Where is the coach? There is no coach. It seems that the feet that will not cross the abbey's threshold will have to cross the street. Shall we go? After all, it's not as if you're pregnant, is it? Indeed, it seems to me this is exactly the weather for a flounder. Perhaps you don't know it. A dull white fish of no particular flavor. Not to a king's taste, perhaps. I can assure you, sir, the king may not be a husband to me in the daylight, but at night he is perfectly adequate to the task. Adequate? Hmm. Be more likely to get a child up my ass than between your thighs. Ah, yes, but then you'd have to wait in line. I hear the queue is considerable. And I can walk by myself, thank you. Trouble was, whilst I had the king's cod but no baby, Steenie had his heart and head and I was alone. And for the final insult, my jailer was to be his mistress. Majesty, is there something wrong? How could there be, madam, since I have no right not to be insulted? Who has insulted you? You're the queen. Surely. Not even the Duke of Buckingham would dare send his mistress to be my lady-in-waiting. But I would appear to be wrong in that, as I am wrong in so many other things. Ah. Ah. Well, perhaps, Majesty... If you were to allow yourself... What can the Queen allow? A little fun. Fun? Pleasure. Pleasure. If you were to smile a little more, you might gain your way sooner than by frowning. <laughs> a little rouge to the cheek, some lipstick, something to make the eyes sparkle. Oh, I'm not a whore, madam. Oh, trust me, Majesty. This is a man's world, and in that world, all women are daughters, mothers, nuns, or whores. The only choice is, do we sell ourselves for a decent price or not? Never heard anyone talk that way before. My confessor is, is not a woman. <laughs> and a little bit of rouge and some play acting will not put a lock on heaven's gate. Gosh. They say you like the theatre. Yes. But in France you used to put on <laughs> masks, plays, yes. But you are still the mistress of your enemy? <laughs> Then make me your friend, madam, if you can do it. And you will always have at least an eye on his doings, however secret they may be. You'd betray him. Being a mistress is like any other transaction. Buckingham looks better when I'm by his side. He likes that. I like that. The king will look better when you stand smiling by his side. He will like that. You will like that. Oh, after all has been done, I... we... You simply have to swallow it, madam. And the Duke goes to France. He is to lead an expedition to save the Protestants of La Rochelle again. <laughs> he will not be here. The way is clear for you. But why are you doing this? Because 
Buckingham will drop me when it suits him, and I think your affection is worth more than his so-called constancy. Do you know the shepherdess? It's a pastoral mask, but... Should I stand on a stage for all to see? Thus Artemis ascends, and all Arcadia rejoices. Lovers' tiff she mends, and praise from many voices is heard within this mossy glade. Very good. Very fine. <laughs> I did not know if you would approve. Not at all. There is a place for entertainments. But I approve very much. I am glad it has pleased you. We had been looking for an improvement in the Queen's behaviour. Then I wish Your Majesty you would inform me if I have done anything to displease you. You have been putting it about, madam, that I caused you to walk in the rain to the detriment of your health. I mention that only on your coronation following your progress from the Abbey, that in order to observe your procession, I had to cross the street in the rain. But as I recall, the day was fine. A fine day? There was no rain on that day. I distinctly remember seeing the sun. The sun? The sun. It was shining. I believe that is the case when it is out. As it was on that day. Indeed. I, I recall I was uncomfortably hot that day. Splendid day. Thank you now. Now, if you will excuse me, madam, I have business to attend. Sir? <laughs> well, <laughs> he was smiling. He was smiling. I believe it was a smile. Oh, he is so formal, Lucy. Every gesture, every word, every minute of his day for all I know is settled and decided and planned and executed and noted. But tonight he smiled. And he enjoyed the play. I was watching his face. When you ran on the stage in your little shepherdess costume, <laughs> it was as if he was seeing you for the first time. Oh, I think I was truly happy for the first time since I came to this country. Then hooray for the play. The house recognizes Mr. Pym. And they sit in the court and watch plays. <laughs> Grown men and women plastered in paint and powder. Prancing in immodest costumes, spouting nonsense verses. And outside Cadiz, the bones of our soldiers lie beneath the waves, yeah, yeah, yeah. lost by the so-called High Admiral, that great man. <laughs> and they sit in the court and watch plays. And within La Rochelle, thousands of Protestants starve, disgrace, failed by the so-called English general-in-chief, that great man, and they sit in the court and watch play. And, and the king says, it is not for us to question his servant, much less one who is so close to him, that great man, that Puppet Master yeah. Buckingham! Was there a change after the rain? It was not rain and the shepherdess? I could not tell, and it was thought best, since the Parliament was all in a, a mutton stew, as the English say, over my play, that I should take the waters of Wellingborough. It was said they were good for barren wives. You will never do it. At home? Uh, 
No one would bet against me. Oh. <laughs> I should think not, Majesty. You are indeed a deadly shot. Now, let's see. <clears throat> Oh. oh, and you were very gallant, Lord Carlyle. I'm sure you missed on purpose. Lucy? My husband may miss a purpose. I never do. There's no point in the game otherwise, is there? <laughs> Touché! <laughs> I get to knock your ball out of play, I believe, Majesty. Hope you don't mind too much. Not at all. I prefer that you are honest and open. And the Queen is never out of play. <laughs> See? <laughs> well, I have a prize for you, if you care for it. Yes? There is a lady hereabouts who is noted for her clear sight. She foretold the accident that felled her husband. There have been many other cases proven. A witch, then? If you dare. Please sit, if you will, Your Majesty. The clock is time. Our master or servant. How did you do that? In time, masters will be servants and servants masters. If you have questions, ask them now, quickly, before time starts again. When will I be with child? There will come a change in things, and then you will be with child. Will it be a... a boy? A future king? Perhaps. Will he live? Until he dies. Well, don't you know? You're supposed to know. I see what I see. The Duke of Buckingham, will he prosper? I see a Thropney knife. I don't understand. A Thropney knife. Will I be happy? For a while you will be happy. But for how long? For 13 years. 13 years? And, and then... What, what then? What can I do? What will happen? It will happen. Can we change nothing? Madam, if I drop a crown, it will fall to the ground. But if I drop a seed, who knows what may grow? In summoning the session of my parliament to the Lord's house. The people's parliament! I must make clear to all the peril in which this nation stands and lay out before you the measures which must be taken. It's for parliament to say what measures it will take. Yeah. And I am confident yeah. that my parliament will recognize the importance of maintaining the true religion the laws and liberties and the just defence of this state. And if you cannot see this, gentlemen, with your own hearts and minds, then even the tongues of angels will not persuade you. What I hear is the defence of that great man and yet another ruinous foreign adventure. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Pym has the floor. Your Majesty... We are all loyal Englishmen here, but our very loyalty commands us to question the raising of money for the Duke of Buckingham's expedition. Loans raised in a manner that goes against the laws and liberties of this nation. Our true friends are suffering in France, sir. And your true subjects are suffering in England, Majesty. Duke of Bucks <laughs> is all the cause of our suffering. Yeah. Illegal taxation yeah, not voted arrest, by this right. house is levied. Arbitrary arrest yeah. is exercised. Yeah. Families are forced to billet soldiers at their own expense. Yeah. There will be no subvention for war, I say, until the peace is settled to our satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. I do not recognise your words, sir, for they are... Disloyal. This house does not recognize you, sir. You sit by my command. I rule by God. Then, for God's sake, get rid of the Duke. The crowds are very quiet, sir. They have no reason. 
This army will save the Protestants of France. Some say it will save the Duke. If he succeeds this time. I will hear nothing against I him. I say nothing against him. But I hear much against him. You should close your ears against such things. I saw a new sheet. It was nailed to a tree as I walked by this you should morning. should close your eyes against such things. What did it say? That the king rules the country, but Buckingham rules the king. You are too close to Lucy Carlyle. That woman is not a good woman. She does not put proper things in your mind. She's my friend. Besides, she's the Duke's mistress. You should approve his taste in whores as much as you approve anything. We cannot meet without arguing. Then perhaps we should not meet at all. It can be arranged, Maria. There are still... <laughs> ah, here comes your friend. It's very fine going by, does he not? Madam. You will bend to my will in the matter, or by God, you will spend the rest of your days in a nunnery. A Protestant one. What is it? Who did? Hush, Father, I'm ready. Your Majesty. May I not even have the tongue? Majesty. The Duke of Buckingham is dead. <gasps> a, a Portsmouth. He was stabbed. It was stabbed a... in front of his wife and sister-in-law <laughs> with a threepenny knife. <gasps> Pray God, not a Catholic. A soldier, they say, who was overlooked and owed eighty pounds pay. But then that could describe the whole army. I believe he died fashionably, as he would have wanted. Will you miss him? Yeah, he was planning to drop me. The king did not approve, and there was only so far down that road he would go. Oh, God, the king. What... what did they say? How did... They say he heard the news, as you did, at Mass. Mm. And they say he betrayed his feeling not one whit. Not one flicker was there to be seen until the mass was over. The reception done with, and the king was in his chamber, fast and alone. And then they say... <laughs> Charles, let me in! Yeah. I shall wait here until you do. I beg of you, my dear. What do you want? I want to weep with my husband. I was never first. When father came south, to be the King of England too. It was Henry who went with him. Henry they cheered as they rode south. Always Henry, the Prince of Wales. The, 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 the warrior, the hunter, the golden. And I was the baby with twisted legs and a weak chest and a tongue that couldn't speak straight. And I was the, the, the one who was going to die. That was the bargain. I didn't know this man. I believe that. Henry would be king. I'd gone to him because... And Henry it was who died. And baby Charles was all that was left of the country. Because Buckingham was stabbed with a threepenny knife and the soothsayer had told me I would be happy for 13 years and somehow I knew this was the moment I must jump for my life. My father feared death and those it touched. Or my life would be lost. After Henry he was distant. As if touching his son would pass on some contagion. He was as alone as I had been on that cold winter day when I first stepped on England's shore. But for him, there was no golden childhood, no lost time in the sun, only the north and closed doors and the crying of a child left too long alone. <sighs> Steeny reached out to me. He was my father's man, but he saw my need and held out his hand and said simply, Friends. Do 
you know what it is for a prince to have a friend who neither flatters nor deceives? Who is everything he wants to be and holds nothing back but gives everything? We were the brothers that Henry and I never were. He, the big brother who loved and cherished and above all understood. You see, he came from nothing, from nowhere. All he was, he made of himself, and through him I was able to make a king of myself. And, and now he's not here. And he'll never, ever be here again. I never knew. How could you know what was between us? How could you know? You were just a girl. Well, I was frightened, too. So much to learn, to be, that I'd never been. I'd only been happy, and then I... We didn't make it easy, did we? If I had tried, really tried, I might have seen a little. I might have been a little... But we weren't. <laughs> Now we are both alone. I so wanted there to be... <laughs> if only what, we what had... I to get. Will you hold my hand, Maria? I could not be there for the burying, but they told me the king was as if made of stone, like the ancient king set around him on their monuments. I understood then the effort it must have cost him to sit like a king, as it had cost the child to stand and walk like a man on twisted legs, to take that weak frame and force it to the saddle day after day, to take that tongue and make it speak. And I understood how much there was to this man, to love and admire in him. And I knew that life was about to begin again. Our life and new life. God be thanked, the Queen finds herself the happy mother of the Prince of Wales. And I am the happy husband and father of a strong and vigorous child. And did you know, he lay with his hands open, which proves for sure he will be wise and generous. First king to be born on English soil for almost a century. Strafford, you speak my mind exactly. A good omen, sir. Shall the bells be rung? Every steeple in every town and village in the land. And let every man and woman, I, child and babe, to celebrate. It's, it's, uh, what we need to bind this nation into one, sir. What is it, Strafford? This is a time of good news. Don't spoil it for me. I'm afraid that's my job. It's now we need to be particularly... Buckingham careful. is gone. They have all they want. Buckingham is gone. They begin to see all they can get. No. No, today everyone celebrates... Thirteen years of happiness. And then... But for then, it was enough. For us. Let us not forget, <laughs> even as we celebrate the birth of a son, the liberties the father has taken from us. Yeah. Five members of this house are still in prison because they refused to pay an illegal tax, raising money for an illegal war. Yeah. Sit 
They held him down. Who? They held the speaker down. I don't understand. Why do they not allow him to stand? No, whilst the speaker sits, the house is in session. Parliament can carry on with their treasonable business. They're not our friends, this Parliament, and yet they are your subjects. What will you do? I don't know. We must do something about Scotland. Oh, can you not leave them be up there in the cold? We're one nation, Maria. Whilst I don't say everyone has to accept bishops and read from the same prayer book, in this country thousands don't, I do say those that want them have a right to them. Live and let live. And the Scots say... No, no bishops and no prayer book for anyone. Strafford says a show of force would make them listen to reason. But to do that, we need money to pay our troops and Parliament will not pass legislation to raise that money. They'd rather go to prison. In fact, they want to go to prison. But you believe you are right? I think so. Mm. Yes, I, I know I am. Mm -hmm. Oh, Queen Elizabeth always used to say, via media, the middle and way... And God has made you king... Oh. I sometimes think our Lord punished me by making me king. Then at least be the king. What do you want to do? What does the king really want to do? I, I wish I could be rid of the whole rabble of them. This house did not invite you, sir. In decency's name, have some respect to the king. Has a right to attend the Lords and summon the Commons. Respect, Mr. Speaker, is like Jacob's ladder, and some go up and some go down. I call this house to order. We will not hear. Come here. We won't hear. Come here. We won't hear. Come here. We I am the king. Listen to me. The Scots, I say, the Scots have thrown out their bishops and a good thing too. We'll listen to you, sire, when you decide to throw the English bishops all the way back to Rome. If you won't hear me, then maybe you'll hear this. These gentlemen are soldiers paid out of the king's purse, since you would not. This parliament is dissolved. This parliament refuses to be so dissolved. Captain, empty the chamber and nail the door shut. Yes, sir. The guard will advance. <laughs> There were to be four children who lived, four blessings, and peace and quiet after Parliament was set aside. Oh, there were always the Scots, with their determination to practice their joyless Calvinist religion. But it was our time, high time, time that passed away so sweetly, thirteen years. Scotland, gentlemen. Always Scotland, sir. They can't abide a bishop, never could, they say. Never will. Are you saying, Bishop, the King's writ no longer runs in the north? I think Strafford has some intelligence. Well? There is a Scottish army gathering outside Berwick-upon-Tweed. 50,000 strong, my reports estimate. There must be every man in that benighted hellhole. Do they intend to invade? Actually to fight their king? For their god, their will. Well, surely more to the point is what we intend to do. Strafford? Twice in the last ten years, we have attempted to raise an army to face the Scots. On both occasions, it has not proved practicable. You're saying I was a bad commander? No, I'm sure he did not mean... The quality of the troops and more to the point the paucity of supplies were the problem, not the king. We couldn't afford it, yes? Yes. And this time? In my opinion, we cannot afford not to. 
Could you explain yourself, Strafford? For 11 years, His Majesty has imposed direct rule of the country through this council. Aye, and there's been peace. Which leaves men time to think about what they want next. Mm. Go on, Strafford. England is a pot on the point of boiling. In pursuit of their own political religious aims, the Puritan tendency has managed to harness a general sense of discontent. Everything that goes wrong. Harvest, trade figures, foreign policy, sour milk, dead lambs. It seemed to be the fault of the government, and the government... Is the king. So far the lid has been kept firmly on the pot, but gentlemen in Scotland, they have thrown the lid away, and the pot boils over. What does that tell us? Why, that the Scots are a scurvy, filthy, dirty, nasty, lousy, itchy, scabby, <laughs> shitty, stinking, slovenly, snotty, barbarous, bestial, false, lying, roguish, devilish crew of covenanting bastards. <laughs> no! It tells every malcontent and Puritan in England that rebellion is possible and that he or she has every chance of getting away with it. We must stand firm and put this Scottish rebellion down. There is no money. Bishop, there will be no bloody king if we don't. Excuse me, Majesty. You must recall Parliament. That is the only way. He says it's the only way. He has nice hands. Eh? You're Strafford. Otherwise, he's a bit of a ferret. Ferret is what I need at the moment. If you call Parliament, will they give you the money? That's the question. Will those dogs bring back the fox or will they tear it apart? That's the question. It becomes all the more important when I'm the fox. Mm, they wouldn't dare. You must be firm. You must give way and call them and be firm and not listen to them when they start to complain. It's a national emergency. We're being invaded. By ourselves. The Scots are us. We are the Scots. I am a Scottish king. Oh. One kingdom, undivided. Dad was right. It isn't easy. Well then, send in the ferret. His Majesty has never needed the wise advice of his Parliament so sorely as now. When Scotsmen have taken up arms against their anointed king, this is not discontent or rebellion. It is treason. treason! There is no other word for it. We must stand against this dragon or its fiery breath will consume us all. Sir. Mr. Pym, should we not consider the cause of this discontent? The cause does not sanctify the remedy. Treason is treason. And comes in many forms, sir. This house, may I remind the king, is the voice of the nation. This house is not anointed by God. But it is, sir, justified by faith and not by bishops. Do you, do you want war? No, no man wants war. Then stop it before it starts by giving the king the money to raise an army that will never fight but merely act as a warning, a prompt to the Scots to return to negotiations. No one wants force. We all want peace. But not at the price of the privileges and rights of this house. The king, the king will talk. Show your loyalty by passing this enabling act and he will come to you and listen in sympathy to your complaints. Let him listen and resolve our complaints and then we will show our loyalty. The king has made the first move by summoning this house. That surely is enough. Not enough! Not, not enough. enough! Not enough! Not enough! Not enough! Not enough! And they will not. Well, perhaps they have a point. How can they, Lucy? He's the king. England isn't France. Now, hold on, don't move. I don't want to stick a pin in you. I want to stick pins in them. And kings are kings. How does it look? Charming. Oh, I want it to be perfect for the king. Do you think... Go on, Lucy. Is it perhaps wise for you and the king to be acting at, well, a time like this with Parliament? But the play's about peace. 
how the spirit of Britain and his wife bring accord to the warring nation. And it is quite beautiful. But it is still a play, and Parliament is Charles still... has promised me there will be no trouble with Parliament. Who then will come from heaven's bower, step down upon this lowly plain? Who shall come upon the hour? Break it down! See here, in lordly car descending to mankind's woes, bring hope of mending. What's this, I spy? My lord, tis war, unending strife, mortal curse. For when men strive their best to do, oft times it seems they do their worst. Sergeant, then why are you here? Look, this, this is my home. Search the place. Any papers, books, weapons, anything, take them. I am a member of Parliament. I am protect Parliament's but... out, Mr. Pym. Forever. You're under arrest. Let Albion be by harmony ruled, and those discord hath set apart, to wisdom hearken, and make all haste with urgent step and hurried pace, so each replenish hope and heart. Don't fret, sir. You'll have company. Maybe you can all pass a few more laws. Now, Majesty, you need to hang them. All of them. A few will do, the rest will learn something. Strafford, I don't want to hang men. I truly desire peace for this country. Here between ourselves, I'll say it. I'd be happy for any man to follow his own conscience. My wife is a papist. I love her nonetheless for it. Mr. Pym is a Puritan. I dislike him no more for it. Can we not live and let live? That is not the question, sir. We can. They will not. You see, they know they are right. God has told them so. They expect to ascend to heaven, sir, as soon as they have fulfilled God's will here on earth. They don't give a twig for this world, only for the next. And anyone who does not obey God must therefore be of the devil's party. Well, then tell me, what is the question? Do you have the courage to go against your every instinct and act firmly? Hang these men because it is the most practical and efficient course of action for the state to take. I am certain, sir. The church will find it in herself to forgive the acts of a monarch forced upon him by unreasonable men. I will not act against my conscience. I could not live with myself if I did. In the long run, that may not be a problem. Do what can the king do? Try and stay afloat. Such a stormy sea. Parliament wants the same thing the Scots want. No bishops. If it comes to that, will the king? What? What is it? I cannot say. But we are friends. I have been talking with some of my gentlemen. Catholic. Gentlemen. Loyal to the king and country. Do you see? They have sworn an oath to protect the king and the rights of the crown. If we cannot rely on Parliament, I can call on them and they will stand by us. Well, then let us pray they are never needed. Does the king know? Not a word. He speaks of offering this and that, of goodwill and good hearts. The king is in attendance. Please sit down, all of you. The Earl of Strafford? is sick, sir. He cannot be here. Is there no way we can call on him? No, sir, there is not. We must settle this matter ourselves, today, here and now. You must call on the guard, sir, to put these mobs down. Parliament is one thing, but anarchy is another. What do they want? God knows everything. Catholics expelled? 
The MPs released, bishops kicked out, altars thrown down. Can, can, can we make a move towards them? Hmm? Offer something? We could expel a few Spaniards, find a Jesuit or two. We could release the MPs. Well, they've learnt their lesson by now. Yeah, they would have learnt it better had you taken Strafford's advice and stretched a few necks. Hardly a Christian sentiment, Bishop. Is a man a Baptist a Christian? We owe them nothing, and believe me, sir, they will give us nothing back but trouble. But they are Englishmen. I don't recognise them. If we want them to fight in our armies and pay our taxes, then we must offer them something. We should, I believe... Release the MPs. But we've only just imprisoned them. We'll expel a few Catholics, hang a couple of agitators, and let the MPs go. Free? Free. And I am going north with the army to teach the Scots a lesson they won't forget while we still have enough money left to do it. He never wanted for courage. He was the king, and he would stand. The head of his people the head of his religion, and the head of his army. You must remember, General, to be strong and fair in victory. Let them understand the power of the king and his mercy too. Let's start with the power, shall we, sir? Advance. <laughs> Advance with God in our hearts and our swords in our hands. The army will advance. General, where is the army? He appears uh, to be retreating. General, why are they retreating? Because I believe the Scots are advancing. God's sake, man, command them to attack. Them, this, the Scots. Sir, they are wet, half-starved, haven't been paid ever. Pressed men, most of them. Actually, most of them... Agree with the Scots. Those who are loyal, let them advance for courage and king and country. Sir, a hundred men against fifty thousand, it's not the Mopoli. It's just ridiculous. And the king can never be ridiculous. What can I do? God help me, Maria. What's to be Shush, done? Hush, my love. Don't let them hear you. The king can never be in despair. The king is God's anointed. I don't want, I never really wanted. Take this cup from me. You know, Maria, I could let everything go. The throne, out with it. The, the work, the show, the endless talking. Just be a country squire, you and I and the children. We could farm and hunt sometimes. You're a good man, my dear. Strafford is your right hand. Use him. And the Scots, sitting in Newcastle, demanding we pay the upkeep of their ghastly army and that any agreement between us is ratified by Parliament. Then call Parliament. You've released the MPs, shown your good faith. There must be decent men amongst them who will listen to reason. And if not, they'll have to listen to the Earl of Strafford and his Irish army. Reasonable men. I wonder if reason still dwells hereabout. What else can they do to us? They dare not throw down the king. They know you will not throw down the bishops. There's nowhere left to go but talk. Be yourself. Be the king. Be England. Tell them if they bring you down, they bring down all that they are and ever will be. Mr. Pierce! <laughs> Our Scottish brothers have been called traitors <laughs> against their king and country. <laughs> For what? For wishing to throw out the bishops? And yet the bishops are still with us. No bishops! No bishops! For wishing to bring in the rule of law, sanctioned by Parliament. And yet that rule is not with us yet. For fair taxes and decent government, and yet they are not with us!
us yet. Yeah. And why? Treason? No. Then who is the traitor at the very heart of this land? Ah. Who is the dragon in heaven that stamps and snorts its horrid smoke over all that is clean and pure? Who sits at the rotten center of all things, bowing her head towards the whore of Rome, using her popish designs to work upon king and church, insinuating the beliefs and practices that cause all decent Englishmen to recoil in horror? Save her! Then I name the Queen, yes. who has been holding secret talks with her Catholic gentlemen! They say you will introduce a bill against the Queen, against me, naming me traitor. The penalty for that is death, Lucy. They want to cut off my head. <sighs> It doesn't have to be that way, Majesty. What do you mean? I don't want you. At least not yet. It's Strafford they want. Oh, they want to try him for being a good servant to the King. I don't know, Majesty. All I do know is that if the King allows it, then all will be well again. What do you mean? They will leave you alone. At least for the time. As for later, who can tell? Things change. Things change? The world is turning upside down, and we with it. Lucy, how did John Pym know I was talking to my gentleman? There was only one person else who knew. Things change. What do we look for in this world, Majesty? Except constancy. And that means choosing sides. I thought you were my friend. Well, Buckingham thought very much the same. And John Pym, your new friend, will you betray him too in the interest of constancy? Trust me, Majesty. On one thing, at least. This is a man's world. And in that world, all women are daughters, mothers, nuns, or whores. Hmm? The only choice is, do we sell ourselves for a decent price? Trafford. Majesty, how may I serve you? What have you done, sir? I... It was the Queen. They went after the Queen. Do you see? Do you understand? I understand very well, sir. John Pym is no fool. You should have hanged him when you had the chance. I had to protect her. It's a pity I was sick, otherwise perhaps I could have... But no, that die was cast a long time ago. You are... You are... They have said you are to be arrested and charged. It's nonsense, all of it. There is no evidence. You will see them off, Strafford. Just, just a moment's inconvenience. And I will stand firm. They, they will not harm you. I, I swear it. Do not. Swear. I swear it, I tell you. Then you will be forsworn. No, my word. A king's word. There will be a trial. They will present such evidence as they can cobble together. I will rebut it. Of course you will. Here, sir. Come to the window. Whilst I still have such a thing rather than bars. Look. What do you see? I see the horse chestnut trees. They are coming into blossom, and I swear, before the conquerors look, fall. Look, sir, look. 
The pane is molded. The glass is flawed. You do not see what you think you see at all. The tree it shows us is so twisted and tortured it will never bring forth anything good. I do not believe that, Strafford. Trust me, all will be well. To save me, Charles was risking the life of his strongest and most able minister. If Strafford went down, then I feared, and perhaps John Pym hoped, that the Stuarts might go down with him. Thomas Wentworth, Earl of Strafford, you stand before this house accused of treason. How do you plead? I do not recognize your place. In A World of Fools and Knaves, by Mike Walker, Maria was played by Vanessa Kirby, Charles by Julian Rhines tutt Buckingham Dominic Maffam, and Lucy Carlyle by Kate Fleetwood. Strafford was Anton Lesser, Pym Vincent Franklin, Eleanor Amaka Akafa, and Mamie was Philippa Stanton. Other parts were played by Ben Crow, Michael Burtonshaw, Paul Stonehouse, Matthew Watson, Sean Murray, and David Seddon. The directors were Jessica Dromgoul and Sasha Yevtushenko.